All right, guys, so we're going to quickly go over the code necessary to record data from our four photoresistors and log that data onto our SD card. So we're going to include the library for a software serial and declare our RX and TX pins like we did before. And we're going to initialize a variable called logger, and that's basically going to be our open log with our SD card in it. In our void setup loop, like usual, we're going to begin serial communication and logger communication at our baud rate of 9600. Now, as we go to our main loop, we're going to initialize a series of variables of type double. Time is just a variable that says how much time has passed since we started the experiment, and that's gonna be measured in milliseconds. These remaining eight values have to do with the individual photoresistors that we're taking measurements of. Photoresistor A, photoresistor B, C, and D. So to start out, you can see that we assign sensor value lowercase a to analog read of one, uh, these are the analog pins that we are connected to, number one, two, three, and four. And as you can see, we assign that to sensor value lowercase a, and then we assign sensor value uppercase a to the analog value and then times its conversion factor. So that's multiplied by five and then divided by 1023. Once we have those variables and once we've taken our timestamp, we're going to print that information to the SD card, and that's logger.print. So we're going to print the time in milliseconds, and then a comma, and then our four sensor values. And then we're gonna have a short delay of 0.1 milliseconds in between. For debugging purposes, you can also print this information to the serial monitor, but when you're actually printing to the SD card, that's not necessary. Uh, you can comment this chunk of code out when you're actually running if you wish. So now let's go look at the MATLAB code. All right, guys, so I'm gonna give a brief overview of the data processing section for this lab. This MATLAB code is relatively complex. It's very long, as you can probably tell. It's over 300 lines long. So even though the construction, the physical construction for this sun sensor is not too complex, we're only using four photoresistors, that means in turn that the processing is gonna be much more difficult because we only have four for photoresistors. So I'm just gonna go over a pretty high level overview of what each section of code does. Uh, there'll be a link to this MATLAB file in the video description so that you can take a look at it. Uh, you can change things around. This may work better for certain trials than others so you can change things around, see how it impacts your processing. So again, I'm just gonna give a pretty high level overview of what section each section does can take it from there. All right, so in this top section, we're just cleaning up a bit, getting rid of all variables. We're loading in our file. Uh, this is the only section that technically you have to input data into. This is just the name of the text file. And then variable B, that's the length between your light source and the center of your box. You're gonna be using that in your calculations later on. And L is the length of one side of your box. And they're unitless because Basically, all that matters is the ratio in between the two. So this can be in inches, meters, centimeters, whatever, whatever you measure in. Uh, so you load the data in to different vectors. We found that it was, uh, results were much more easy to comprehend if we filtered the data. So you're, we filtered the data using Escolay filt with a filter value of 45. Uh, then we plotted our data. And once I run this whole program, you'll see what that looks like. We also plotted the filter data. This is all just for visualizing your data. We're not actually using the, these two sections in our calculation. One of the first bigger chunks is finding the dominant side at every time in our data set. What that means is that as we rotate the box, certain sides of the box are gonna have dominant sides, as in maybe side A is facing the sunlight, and so it's more dominant than side B, C, or D. And just because of the geometry of our box, Sometimes two of the sides are going to be dominant, but sometimes only one is. So there's a lot of cases where we're only gonna be using one side of the box in our calculations, which makes it much more difficult. But all that this does is it creates a vector called dominant, and at every time that is gonna be either one, two, three, or four, representing side A, B, C, or D. This section will get a vector of, it'll create a vector much like dominant, but this time it's called slope, and that possesses the slope 
of our data at every moment. So it'll tell us whether our, the voltage at a specific instance is increasing or if it's decreasing or if it's relatively constant. Next, uh, we're going to calculate the spin direction of the box at every, every moment in time. You'll see later in the code why we need this and then we'll plot it at the end. And it's either going to be, it's going to create a vector called direction or it's going to calculate a value called direction and then put that on the end of a vector called spin. And spin will be the either a one or a zero for each index representing clockwise for one or counterclockwise for zero. And again, that'll be put into the vector called spin. Later on, we're going to be, uh, this no longer needs to be here. This section finds the local maximum of the dominant side of your data. So let's say uh, time is equal to n, the dominant side is number two or side b. We wanna be able to know what the maximum value of side b is in that time, in that small time interval. Because when we're gonna be calculating the angle, we're gonna be using cosine. And so we need to know what to multiply or divide cosine by or the cosine of the angle by. Um, and you'll see that a little bit later in the code, actually in the next section, uh, calculating the zenith angle. In other words, the zenith angle is the angle of incidence that the light is hitting the photoresistor at. And so basically we know that if the light is hitting the photoresistor straight on, that means the zenith angle is zero and it's basically receiving its maximum voltage. And at 90 degrees, we should be receiving a voltage of zero and that zenith angle corresponds to about 90 degrees. So we're doing that for each dominant side, we're calculating the zenith angle and then concatenating onto the end of a vector called the zenith. We also have to uh, determine if the dominant face has meached, reached its maximum value yet. That helps us in deciding which way the box is spinning or not because we can determine uh, what value and when the dominant side reaches its maximum value. And if it hasn't reached it yet, that means that it's spinning towards it. So that helps us determine which way it's spinning. Calculating alpha angles, that's the most important section of our script. Alpha angle is what the term that we're using for the absolute orientation of the box. So to avoid error buildup, we are resetting our absolute orientation equal to 0, 90, 180, or 270, depending on when which side receives a maximum value. So let's say at one instance, side A is at a maximum, that means that the box is at zero degrees. And in turn, if side B is receiving a maximum value, then it is at 90 degrees and so on and so forth. And the reason we're doing that is because we don't want uh, our data to drift. Uh, we don't want error buildup, so this compensates for that. And then we also have to be able to calculate angles in between 0, 90, 180, and 270. And that's what these four sections do. We have scenario one, two, three, and four. We're using the zenith angles that we calculated above. And if you look at the PDF document that's attached to this video, it'll give a lot more information on the specific formulas and calculations that we used for calculating beta in each section, and then in turn calculating alpha for each section. So uh, as you can see, these scenarios are if it's spinning one way and it has not reached, I believe this is counterclockwise. You'd have to go up in the code and check. If it's counterclockwise and it has reached its maximum, then you're gonna be using a certain formula. Uh, if it's counterclockwise and it hasn't reached its maximum yet, then you're gonna look at a different formula. Uh, this all depends on what orientation the box is in. So if the sensor that we're using is, is below the zero axes, then you're going to be using one formula. And if it's above the zero axes, you're going to be using another formula. So as you can see, we have four different, very similar, but different scenarios here in the sense that uh, much of the code is the same, but uh, usually it's beta and the new alpha sections that have different formulas. Uh, last but not least, we're going to plot our data. I'll just run the entire code and you can see what it looks like. So as you can see, we're gonna have three figures that pop up. First of which just displays our raw data. We have site A, B, C, and D, and then we have the same data but filtered. And then this is a plot of the dominant side that we're using for our calculations. 
So you can see one corresponds to side A, which is at its maximum here, and then maybe down here you'll see that uh, side D is the one that's highest, so that means four is the dominant side, and this repeats. And then you can see a graph of the spin. You can see the dominant side changes here and it starts going the opposite direction. You can kind of see that in the data as well. That means that it started spinning the other direction. So zero corresponds to, I believe it's counterclockwise. You have to check on that in the code again. And then it switches right here. So this is the point where it changes spin direction. Figure two, those are the plotted zenith angles. And you can see, you can see that uh, th these are the zenith angles for the dominant side, whenever which side is dominant. You can see that the zenith angles begin to change once it's hit around 40 or 45 degrees. And intuitively that makes sense because once a certain side be goes beyond that zenith angle, typically another side starts becoming dominant. And so the zenith angles will start decreasing again once another side has become dominant. Last but not least, you can see our box rotation values or our alpha values and as you can see we started close to zero and we started increasing uh, this is measured on a scale from zero to 360 we start increasing and then as soon as we hit 360 it goes back down to zero and it starts increasing again and this is where we hit our change in spin direction we start going the opposite way we go from zero to 360 and we decrease again and then we just barely go back up to 360 again and go down a little bit so as you can see um, this is a delicate process. The processing is not perfect. This code will probably be undergoing refinements as time goes on and we'll update that link in the video section. You can also play around with this on your own. Let us know if you develop a system that gives you more accurate results. Let us know in the comments and thanks for watching.